and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. In this hour, Donald Trump versus the so-called deep state. A new book examines this political struggle and the tension between the presidency and the administrative state. The authors of Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic join us, and Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. While president, Donald Trump regularly complained that a deep state was undermining his policies and his decisions. He painted a picture of a conspiracy of unelected government officials seeking to overthrow the democracy by challenging the president. On today's show, we examine the role of the so-called deep state. We will explore the historic roots of the president's political struggles against the administrative state. And we will seek to understand the impact of Donald Trump on the institution of the presidency and the Republic. We have the authors of a new book entitled Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic, The Deep State and the Unitary Executive from Oxford University Press. Stephen Skorenik, who is professor at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies and of Political Science at Yale University. His publications include The Policy State, an American Predicament, and The Search for American Political Development. John A. Dearborn, postdoctoral associate and lecturer at Yale University and soon to be assistant professor at Vanderbilt University. He is the author of a forthcoming book, Power Shifts, Congress and Presidential Representation. And Desmond King is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of American Government at the University of Oxford and a fellow of Nuffield College, Oxford. His publications include Still a House Divided, Race and Politics in Obama's America, and Fed Power, How Finance Wins. Thank you all for joining us. And Professor uh, Sporanek, I'm gonna ask you the first question, since this is a book about the deep state. What is the deep state? Well, thanks Doug for having us. Well, the deep state used to be as a term in political science that referred to arrangements in governments like Turkey and Egypt where the military would monitor the political leadership and condition its control. But in Trump's America, it took on a much wider meaning. Trump used it to refer to cadres of administrators who were putting their own interests and ideology ahead of the preferences of their duly elected president, their duly elected leader. So he charged that these cadres of administrators were hindering the pursuit of the president's priorities. Now, many people, dismiss this out of hand as political hyperbole. But in our book, we took it more seriously than that. The deep state has a kind of pejorative, needless to say, a pejorative connotation. But as we see it, the American state is deep. And so we wanted to look at the various dimensions of depth in the American state. And there are, in fact, several. So when we talk about the deep state, we're talking about several things. One, just the vertical reach of the government from the center through to the local, to the locales, to, uh, to local neighborhoods. More than that, we wanted to refer also to the insulation of administrators, to the rules and routines and the roles uh, that determine duties, and that in, in that sense, insulate them to the extent that they're defined by their duties, insulate them from top-down hierarchical impositions and arbitrary impositions from on high. We also saw depth in human resources, that is the knowledge-based authority that the, that the government commands, that is uh, the professional expertise, the technical know-how, the um, the institutional memory, all of which was very much at issue in Trump's charge against the deep state. But these are very real things, and it refers to connections that administrators in particular have to universities and think tanks and knowledge-based societies, uh, professional societies. So in all these ways, we wanted to recognize that in fact, the American state is deep, quite apart from the pejorative connotations that Trump attached to the idea. And then to go, once we establish that there is something, there is depth to the state, then to move from there to try to consider the 
the charge of a kind of conspiracy against the presidency. Now, John Dearborn, as, as I read the book and thought about the deep state, I was immediately turned to Max Weber and the notion of a professional bureaucracy that would bring about you know, better policies for the state and the creation of, of a modern state. Is that ultimately what the deep state is? A, a group of administrators who have spent their lives focused on, on certain policies and on, on, on certain administrative tasks? That's a big part of it, I would definitely say. Um, so for us, one of the indicators of depth in the state is the idea that administrators and officials should have some authority of their own uh, beyond just the authority of the president in the executive branch. But it's not entirely just about administrators in the executive branch. I would say that depth and the, the broader um, idea of the deep state is the connections between those administrators to the wider society. So for example, um, you could have retired military officials that commentate on um, foreign affairs on TV, or in the case of the response to the pandemic, you have both scientists within the government, but you also have pharmaceutical companies or independent scientific boards that are associating with them. And we think that those connections are also indicators of depth in government. And so then Desmond King, to kind of follow that up, it sounds like what what John Dearborn is describing is what old political science literature used to refer to as iron triangles, the relationship between public service, perhaps elected officials and industry is uh, how similar is that concept, which was always kind of seen as, as kind of conspiratorial and, and certainly mm. undemocratic. Mm. Yes, that's a useful analogy. I think what we mean by the deep state or what's involved in it though, is, is more about expertise and professionalism. And we talk particularly about the State Department, where there is this accumulation of skills and competences, which are then um, transferred, you know, administration to administration. And as a bureaucratic base, which is um, not to be mocked, but to be drawn upon. Um, I mean, a lot of the deep state is a lot of the discussion of the American state, as you know, is complex because people think about government, not about the state, but there is a state. And it's implicitly contrasted with um, centralized bureaucratic states of the sort that we have in Europe, particularly in France and Germany. Um, and in the US, this has always been much more based on an individual government department rather than an overall uh, sense of the bureaucracy working together. Um, and I think I, I'm very pleased with the book because I think we've sort of we've probed this notion of depth in a way that hasn't been done before. We show how germane it is to the um, understanding of the US government. It doesn't have to be a pejorative term. It's actually something quite valuable. Um, we trace through, as you as you know from reading the book, particularly um, competence in, in the um, medical sphere and the kind of conflicts that arose early in the presidency of, early in the period of the pandemic with the Trump presidency, um, where, uh, depth was really quite important and continues to be important. Um, we, we, we have confidence in these leading scientists who are, who are civil servants. Um, I mean, some of them are politically appointed at the cabinet level, but actually the key actors are all, are all civil servants and they represent depth in a very profound sense. And it's not a kind of simplistic defense of, of a deep state. We, we, we know that that's a term which has got problems behind it, but it is talking about in the context of a significant Republican government, a significant concept of the um, American government as a state, that there are these things, these competences, which are quite important are transferred from um, uh, administration to administration. And I know, Stephen, that this use of the term deep state, the president could have said this in, in the book, you certainly could have simply spoken to the presidency versus the administrative states. And there's lots of literature on that. The deep state part of it has this conspiratorial element that seems attached to that. So first of all, how much is the use of the deep state helping us to conceptualize the state as almost being conspiratorially minded against voter wishes, voter interests? In the book, we try to make the distinction between depth, depth as an asset, 
and the deep state charge as, as you say, a kind of conspiracy. The conspiracy in the deep state charge is against the alleged authority of the president to command and control the executive branch. And it's that tension that the book is trying to draw out between these claims of exclusive hierarchical unitary control over the executive branch and the resources that the state commands, uh, that the state embodies in, in its depth, in its expertise, uh, in its rules and regulations and routines. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the Trump administration, when uh, that uh, in asserting direct hierarchical command and control over the bureaucracy by um, demanding subordination, Trump drew out uh, these manifestations of depth. And he uh, not only uh, uh, allowed us to see them, but also to see what was valuable about them. You know, So in the impeachment trial, the State Department officials go and they put on their best good government values are on display and really competing with Trump as to who best represents the public interest. And this was very kind of interesting to us that here's the president's view of the public interest. That is, I represent the people and you're, you're my subordinates. And these bureaucrats are saying, no, we represent good government, regular uh, order, regular processes, regular decision-making processes. And uh, I think for the first time in a very long time, people were, the American people were host to this display of these competing value systems and not just uh, dumping on bureaucrats. And uh, John Dearborn, then that kind of brings to mind the American system. We learned from the first days that we studied the constitution in high school about checks and balances. So is it best to sort of view the administrative state, the deep state as just another check on executive power in this context or is it something else? Well, it doesn't have to be. So I think for many presidents in the last few decades and Trump chief among them, they've started to conceive of the administrative state, especially in the terms that you mentioned as a sort of check and a constraint on their own authority. But there is a history um, in American government where presidents' positions were bolstered by the development of an administrative state in several ways. So things like the Bureau of the Budget that helped um, give the president authority to propose a budget to Congress or the Council of Economic Advisors or the National Security Council or the Executive Office of the President. At that time in the 20s, 30s and 40s, the administrative state and some of these capacities were viewed as helping presidential leadership. And it's really more since the 1970s, maybe starting especially with Richard Nixon, that presidents have started to look upon the bureaucracy uh, more skeptically and as potentially hindering their objectives. And at the same time, they've wanted more hierarchical control over the bureaucracy because they see administration as a way to accomplish policy goals, especially in an era of more divided government and polarization. So I think the checks and balances framework makes a lot of sense there, but the interesting thing about it to me for presidents is on the one hand, again, the administrative state is both potential check and potential opportunity in terms of their ability to govern more unilaterally. I could, I could say a little bit more about that. One thing that struck us when in writing this book is how, how much depth is tied to the interests of Congress and the bureaucracy. I think this gets to your point about checks and balances. That Congress has an, in, has an interest in bolstering the depth of the executive branch for the very reason that it doesn't want it to be exclusively the province of the president, right? That it, so when these administrators um, uh, resist, they're often resisting on the basis of their statutory authority or on the basis of uh, statutory provisions for whistleblower provisions. These are things that Congress or inspectors general that Congress has imposed on the executive branch, deepening the executive branch. And as you say, checking the unilateral authority of the president. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Doug Becker. We're discussing a new book, Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic, The Deep State and the Unitary Executive, with Steve Skorenik of Yale University, John Dearborn of Yale University, and Desmond King of the University of Oxford. And so 
that's when King, at this point, thinking of a potential check on power and the potential contestations or co-optation of the deep state kind of leads to the next main theme of the book, which is the unitary executive theory. This notion that the president is to lead the executive branch and, and the power should be rather centralized within the presidency. How much is, is this kind of an inherent tension? This is the, the administrative state of the deep state pushing against a unitary executive approach to governance. Well, I think there is a tension here. The deep state concept is, is the way we develop in the book, I think is a very important um, development within political science, which has studied the US state um, in great detail, basically since Stephen's book in 1982 on, on the new administrative state. And the deep state fits into the context of how the state was developed in the progressive era, the New Deal era, and then in the, in the Second World War, but particularly in the, the Cold War period. And the deep state comes out of that. The unitary theory, the unitary executive argument is very much rooted in a um, judicial interpretation of power in the United States, which of course has been there since the founding of the Republic because the constitution set things up to um, resolve disputes between the states and the um, federal government in the courts. But this is a particular argument about the powers of the president, the executive with, that come from the constitution. And the unitary executive thesis is an argument that there is really quite a lot of absolute power embodied or entrenched in the presidency, in the office of the president. Um, and one of the things we point out in the book is that this is not just a, uh, a Republican uh, preference. It's one that both uh, Democratic presidents and, and as well as Republicans have used in the last couple of decades. Their use of the theory of the unitary executive is partly to do with the way American government has become very, um, the, the common term is dysfunctional, but gridlocked, very hard to get things accomplished through the Congress. And in that context, presidents have chosen to argue they have unitary executive powers. Um, we, we do set it up as, a, as something of a tension between the two, between the deep state and the executive, uh, the unitary executive. Um, and we expect that tension to continue into the future. Um, but they are um, inherently related, I think, and very, very, very significantly uh, uh, bound to each other. The, the um, unitary executive is, is something that the Supreme Court has, for the most part, become increasingly sympathetic to. Um, and again, this is not just Republican presidents nominating justices, but also Democratic presidents nominating them. I think probably John and Stephen have views on this as well. Yes, Stephen, actually, um, is this a function of divided government? So the unitary executive is in part because Congress has been pretty gridlocked and, and being, being able to pass policy. Because I, I immediately start thinking about issues like filibuster reform and the relationship that could have to the executive. So when you have a president like President Biden who has both houses of Congress and the presidency, but still is going to have difficulty getting things done. It has to be awfully tempting to just centralize power within the presidency and use things like executive actions rather than congressional action uh, to be able to implement policy. It should be said, I think, that the idea of the unitary executive has been there all along. It's anchored in Article 2 of the, it's a constitutional claim. It's anchored in the first sentence of Article 2 that the executive power shall be vested in the president of the in a president of the United States. But what's interesting to us, and that's an unqualified claim, the executive power shall be, is vested in the president, right? It's an unqualified claim. But what's interesting to us is that this theory of the unitary executive really gained currency in the 1970s. And this goes to your point about the rise of divided government. That is one, well, part of it is the rise of divided government. The other part is that up at, from the progressive era up to the 1960s, this vast expansion of the administrative arm of the executive branch, the, the bureaucracy has just penetrated into all, 
all aspects of American life. And in the context of divided government, or as uh, Des was saying, the rise of what we call gridlock, governing the nation through the control of administration, rather than presidential leadership of Congress and getting new policy, as getting new policies through Congress becomes more difficult, the attractions of using administrative authority, since it's already um, uh, touching on all aspects of American life, using that becomes a much more attractive strategy for presidents. And it's in the, and then this begins, uh, I think, along with that, um, legal theorists begin to develop the theory of the unitary executive that justifies presidents clamping down on administrators and making administration a kind of strong arm of their preferences. I think that this is um, you know, a claim that this is the way it was always meant to be because it's in the constitution. Uh, I think it's problematic because all sorts of things have changed. <laughs> all sorts of things changed on other terms, not on the basis of the unitary executive, but changed on other terms. And then all of a sudden we get this big bureaucracy and we go back to the constitution and say, oh, wait, 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 the president has complete control over that. Uh, so I think that um, there's all sorts of paradoxes in reclaiming that original constitutional language in light of all this development. Now, John Dearborn, I think we've done a pretty good job of highlighting there's a historical trend towards the unitary executive, but we always seem to circle back to, though Donald Trump might have met, you know, been part of a historical trend, it was not a typical presidency. And in particular, when the deep state kind of famously, uh, Miles Taylor or Anonymous coming out and saying, don't worry, there's plenty of us here that are making sure that the president's policies are really not being implemented. And so the fact that the contest was really raised to a fever pitch under Donald Trump, uh, first of all, how, again, how accurate is that description? And secondly, does that demonstrate now that maybe this tension is going to take a different turn going into the future? So I think, first of all, you're right to phrase uh, the Trump presidency experience with this maybe as a fever pitch. I do think that we view it as certainly a culmination. I think there's a huge element of spectacle to it. But one of the things that we tried to do in this book purposefully, I think, was there's plenty out there, both in political science and elsewhere, that's going to characterize Trump as an aberration, as something separate. And certainly, you know, in elements of character and in different ways, that may be true. But we consciously wanted to show some of the institutional and, and ideational roots of this presidency and trends that helped make somebody like that possible and that made some of his you know, character in the presidency have such an impact that it did. And I think one of the most unique things about the Trump presidency, we would argue, is the connection that he forged between the unitary executive idea and the idea of a deep state. That's really his signature move and the signature move of those around him. So the connection between these ideas on the one hand, as we've already established, the deep state is a political allegation. It's saying there's a shadow government. He's claiming that they're hindering the chief executive. And on the other hand, we know that the unitary executive claim says the president should have complete control over administration. The relationship between those two ideas is that if you allege that there is a problem of a deep state, then you are basically saying the solution is a unitary executive. And this is really one of the central theses of the Trump presidency. It's the interaction between those two claims and those two different conceptions of government that's implicated in literally every major controversy of the Trump presidency, the Russia scandal, the Ukraine first impeachment, uh, the pandemic, as well as lesser known ones too. And when you look at that relationship between the two ideas and those two systems of government, what you see is this. The unitary executive, the presidential viewpoint, tries to per conjure up the deep state as a threat to the president's constitutional authority and the president's, the popular will of the people that elected him. 
But those that resist the president, the administrators or others representing depth, they conjure the unitary executive as being a threat to the rule of law and reason. And so again, to go back to your phrasing, when you say that it was a fever pitch, it's that interaction, I think, that really makes that stand out. And that's what's distinct about the Trump presidency. As Steve said before, it really allowed us to see depth in full in a way that we probably hadn't. Steve Skoranek, you know, presidents aren't aliens. <laughs> you know, they are products of the American political system. And the idea that Trump is an aberration, that he wasn't normal, and now Biden is president, we're back to normal. I think this is, uh, this is really misguided. We, we wanted to think about the institutions that made, the institutional arrangements that made Trump is impossible. And so far as I can tell, while Joe Biden may have a different approach and he may be more sympathetic to administrative depth, those arrangements, those institutional arrangements are still there. And uh, the institutional arrangements that made Trump is impossible are still there. And that's what we wanted to draw attention to. It's not Trump is a curiosity. It's that this is the state of the state in America. Desmond King. And we find um, there are parallels here with the uh, Nixon administration, for instance, um, and the way in which power was used and the way in which the unitary executive was operationalized at that period. And, and also with some Democratic presidents, as I've said, Clinton and Obama and so forth, uh, as we say in the book. But I think this is really important. I think Steve's point is really crucial here. This, there's an there's a institutional, historical and American political development context to the presidency. And I think scholars talking about elections have got this. They realize, you know, Trump was not just about Trump, but expressed something going on in the uh, electoral system and amongst voters' preferences. And likewise, the institutions of the presidency and of the American state are um, um, vulnerable to this sort of um, um, tra transformation of criteria. And it has a, that, and I think that's why the deep state, which you started with, Doug, is really important to go back to that because this is something that's there. And we've, I think in the book, done a very good job of explaining, well, self-promotionary, but I think we've done a very good job of explaining what that means. We've disaggregated those terms and why those might be taken seriously. And not just for an individual presidency, but for presidencies um, in going into the future, as well as some of the ones that we think about in the past. Um, and there's no question, the one thing we haven't mentioned, perhaps that we should mention, is that the term the administrative state is a phrase that's used by, particularly by critics of government and of bureaucrats and of civil servants. Um, and um, the deep state is, is not dissimilar, but it's slightly different to that term, the administrative state. And, and we are um, documenting something which I think is uh, embedded in the US political system and which we need. Um, and going back to your question originally about the iron triangles and the kind of conspiratorial sense of this deep state, the way we set it out is not a conspiratorial institution. It's a set of institutions, knowledges, competences, and um, ideas transferred across um, personnel, across generations, which is a resource for the um, uh, presidencies that they can use. When we come back, how has the bureaucracy or the so-called deep state affected the policies that have arisen from Donald Trump's administration? Stay with us. You are listening to The Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. The tensions between the bureaucracy and the presidency have led to some disastrous policies in the Trump administration. We'll explore the implications of this struggle. I'm Doug Becker. We're discussing a new book, Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic, The Deep State and the Unitary Executive, with Steve Skoranek of Yale University, John Dearborn of Yale University, and Desmond King of the University of Oxford. Desmond King, I want to circle back and think about some of the different issue areas where this has manifested itself, in particular, since you've made a reference to the State Department, where there's been a lot of the depth of, you know, of the deep state and certainly some of the greatest areas of tension and contention between Donald Trump and the deep state were within the State Department. How much is the deep state an expression of 
American national interests internationally being more consistent, more stable than just from president to president. And issues like the implementation of uh, international law, international treaties that the United States has signed. Because that seemed to be the one area where the president challenged a series of American policies, military policies, mm -hmm. trade policies, et cetera. And the deep state really pushed back saying, no, we have commitments that extend beyond the president's interests. That's an excellent question and, and a very complex area. I think we recognize that the senior positions in all the government departments and executive departments are appointments by each new administration. As we know, so each new administration gets to make about 3,000 appointments at the senior levels of, of government departments, including the State Department, um, seeking to put in place people who they think are most sympathetic to their, to their agenda, to their goals. Um, I, I think the State Department is a good example because there is a very strong esprit de corps, professional sense amongst the career bureaucrats. It's a, it's a very competitive process to join the State Department, to join the, the diplomatic service. Um, they do have shared values from that, um, and which they believe they carry forward. So I, I, th I think it's a very vivid case where a notion of certain norms and rules that should be act should be um, the basis for international engagement were pretty rudely challenged by some of the appointees. And the conflict there uh, was took on a political and ideological force, as you were suggesting. Um, what came out in the hearings about the impeachment was the extent to which the um, politicization of the senior officers and the senior members of the State Department were really out of sync with um, professional norms and professional competences. Um, and the deep state was a um, deep state that the bureaucratic resource base was, saw itself, I think, as, as um, defending and representing certain values that were being challenged. And, and straying into, um, I mean, I think civil servants have to work with policies and politicians they don't agree with, but this was straying into areas of illegality, politicization to an extent that was really at variance with what one would expect from a, from a professional um, modern civil service of that sort. If I can add to that. John Dearborn. On your question with foreign policy, um, we also see that sort of issue of stability in the White House as well, among the White House staff in the early days. So the journalist Bob Woodward, for example, famously chronicled how some members of the Trump administration, um, such as Gary Cohn and the staff secretary, Rob Porter, were quite literally taking papers off of the president's desk. Those were in a direct sense about trade policy, but actually what it was really about, why they seemed to be so desperate to resist the president's orders, was because President Trump didn't seem attuned or to care that much about how those trade policies were deeply connected to other issues such as US military installations or the stability of the Korean Peninsula, for example. So in many cases, the resistance even from Trump's own staff had some sort of international component like that. And of course, one of the great ironies that we find in the book is that arguably some of the greatest acts of outright subversion, uh, a la the deep state charge, are actually happening among Trump's own staff, whether that be Gary Cohn, Rob Porter, um, a little bit further afield, but still in that realm, anonymous, Miles Taylor. Um, those were folks that arguably were taking some of the most direct actions against him. Steve Skoranek. I want to push in a slightly different direction, an aspect of the book. So. Trump is an insurgent and uh, he uh, has came to power with a, a broadside critique of the state as rigged and corrupt. So he's coming into power and he obviously he wants to change things. <laughs> so uh, the pushback from the deep state uh, is in some sense, what's interesting I think uh, for us is two competing sets of authority, two competing 
visions of how the government works. One is, well, you elected this guy and he had this critique, so why shouldn't he transform the government? And then you have the government pushback on the basis of uh, competence, uh, circumspection, consistency, continuity in government. These are two different value systems that are clashing. And what's interesting to us, I think, is not that the defense of the deep state against the president or the defense of the president against the deep state, but this syndrome in American government where we have these two competing visions and competing uh, uh, understandings of what good government is uh, that really came to a head in the Trump presidency. And uh, John Dearborn, to kind of follow up some of what you're describing, I mean, first of all, I'd like to note that part of what we're discussing are political appointments made by the president pushing back, in particular in areas like national security, certainly talk about intelligence, um, you know, as another area. But I, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with, with a guest in one of my classes back in 2018. We had the Assistant Secretary of Defense, and I had a student ask about the, uh, the Navy's concerns with climate change. And he gave a kind of a famous response that said, well, we're the Department of Defense. We exist all over the world. We have to concern ourselves with reality. And so the challenge was, you know, climate change is actually happening and the Navy is really, you know, quite concerned with that. So how much of it is uh, kind of unique to, to Donald Trump in that he seemed to have this desire to use rhetoric to change realities and, and to simply declare certain things were not happening that actually were and the pushback coming just from experts in the field who he happened to appoint versus it being some administrative pushback that is kind of typical between the executive and the deep state. Kind of the similar question is how atypical is Donald Trump on these areas? Well, you're right that there's there's always could be some tensions between presidents and certainly even members of their own cabinet. But actually, there's there's several examples that demonstrate um, just how much, as you say, Donald Trump did want his officials to really push exactly the line that he wanted. I think one of the revealing cases in the book for us of this is Trump's engagement with the Department of Homeland Security um, on immigration, um, his response to migrants at the border. Because what's interesting to us about this is many of the officials that he appointed and later fell out with, whether that be Secretary of Homeland Security Kirsten Nielsen or um, one of his directors of USCIS, um, L. Francis Cisna, these folks largely agreed with the Trump extreme restrictive immigration agenda and yet they still fell out and still were pushed out by him. And so then the question becomes why? Well, there's a couple of things. One is that in many cases, their resistance to Trump was not about disagreement with the policy per se, but was a disagreement based on what they felt was legal, based on what they felt was actually feasible. Um, the Trump administration and White House aide Stephen Miller came up with at one point a plan to do you know, these mass roundups in sanctuary cities simultaneously. And basically their officials at DHS said both, you know, this is of questionable legality and also we don't have the resources to do this. Not that long after that, you see both Cisna and Nielsen pushed out. And Trump replaces them with folks like the um, acting uh, official, Ken Cuccinelli, who, who was everywhere at the department. And in fact, one of his greatest attributes to Donald Trump was that he was on TV all, all the time, you know, pushing the Trump agenda on Fox News or other places. And that was what President Trump valued about him, that he was A, willing to, you know, meet his full expectations rhetorically, but also that he was willing to push, you know, career officials and others to the absolute limits of what they could do in a way that even Nielsen and Cisna were not. You know, uh, the, D, the, the unitary executive is a legal theory, right? It's a legal theory that's promulgated by legal scholars. Presidents are not constitutional theorists, right? And certainly Trump wasn't, we're not saying Trump is a constitutional theorist, although he did surround himself with Unitarians. He surrounded himself with advocates of the Unitary theory. What's interesting to us is this idea of the Unitary executive um, in, as presidents latching onto ideas that are of use to them, right? 
And once they latch onto these ideas that are of use to them, they take on a very different meaning and a, a, a very different coloration. And therefore you get these kind of, well, I have uh, exclusive hierarchical control over the executive branch bumping up, bumping up, as John says, against basic questions of legality. Uh, that's not part of the constitutional theory, right? But it is part of the practice. I think we see the idea in practice when a president takes it seriously. So, okay, I'm, I am, I alone am the executive branch. I, as William Barr said to Donald Trump, you alone are the executive branch. You know, uh, Trump took that seriously. Which then reflects Desmond King on one area that certainly came under fire towards the end of the Trump administration was his um, his firing of several officials within the Justice Department, actually very early on the firing of James Comey and his attempt to control the FBI. There's probably no one more significantly in support of the unitary uh, executive theory than the Attorney General mm -hmm. at protecting presidential prerogatives. So. Is it fair to say that, in essence, the president was doing battle with what was considered legal by the administrative state, by the deep state? That's a great question. I noticed that there was a reproach this week to William Barr. You may have seen that by, uh, by the, um, Justice uh, Jackson. Uh, again, going back to the fact that uh, Barr's summary of the Mueller report was, was, was um, uh, rather too pithy and rather too... Um, biased in well, biased or or took a particular interpretation that favored the presidency at the time. Um, the Barr case perhaps is strength for the unitary executive theory because, as Stephen I think remarked, uh, the Attorney General gave him permission to treat the presidency as the unitary executive, um, something which I think that Trump instinctively was doing already, but this was was empowered by the by the um, interpretive framework that um, the Attorney General took. Um, I, th I think we have some, uh, several cases in, in the book, the second part of the book has empirical cases of this recent presidency, where we find that Trump worked through staff. He, he sacked a lot of staff. He then also preferred to appoint acting um, officials so they wouldn't have to go through congressional um, congressional nomination process. Um, so in that sense, he was finding um, appointees who would best agree with the unitary executive theory um, and who would see the state in, in those terms rather than, rather than, and well, he often, he often pitched it as against the deep state as we, as we said at the beginning of the conversation. Um, so yes, I think that's, I think your, your point is exactly right on this. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. We're discussing the deep state, the tension between the presidency and the administrative state, and the implications of this tension with Steve Skoranek of Yale University, John Dearborn of Yale University, and Desmond King of the University of Oxford. Now, I want to make sure that one area that we discuss is what may have been the greatest uh, implications of the pushback between the deep state and the presidency in the contemporary times, and that's of course the pandemic. So uh, Stephen Skornick, how much of this has been this tension producing suboptimal American policy in wrestling with the pandemic, you know, having profound health implications for the American people? The unitary executive idea has a very difficult time dealing with the idea uh, with with the concept of teamwork, <laughs> of uh, a collective effort in which the president is mobilizing those who have authority and expertise that he doesn't possess. That is mobilizing a team for emergency response. And what you, you saw that playing out in the pandemic response that is at first Trump downplaying the issue, then creating this task force and putting Mike Pence in charge of it, and then not allowing even Mike Pence to, Mike Pence would get in front of the cameras and he would let the experts, he would let the experts speak and he would nod, they would tell us their, uh, the, state of, the state of affairs and Pence would nod, but 
Trump couldn't live with that either. He had a very difficult time um, acknowledging the authority of others and the need for the authority of others. And so he kept stepping on their message and completely by the uh, spring and summer of last year, completely muddling the message to the American people uh, with, I think, quite disastrous effects. Even as he is, even as he is uh, uh, authorizing Operation Warp Speed to get the vaccine, uh, he is undermining the authority of the experts who are his own spokesmen, right? And uh, sowing doubt about the authority of experts, of, of these medical officers, while he's ultimately going to be dependent on everybody buying into this vaccine. I think the part of that, part of the problem we're seeing now with vaccine hesitancy is a product of the doubts that Trump sowed about the medical experts who were running the effort. I think, th I think this was a classic case of, of the deep state really, really um, in conflict with the administration and with the, with the American state, because um, uh, this is where most of us would, would take the view, I think Douglas, that, that if, if there are professionals who know something about an area, epidemiologists, medical scientists, immunologists, and so forth, who were crucial to the, to the response to this crisis, but they were, um, uh, they were undermined in many ways. And there were the minority interests within that group were brought to the fore in the administration. So he, so it's, it's always possible to find professionals who will support a particular view, but they were clearly not part of the uh, CDC and the NIH community and so forth. And this really mattered, I think, to how the state operated. We got a very vivid view of the conflict between these two uh, approaches to how the state operates. Um, and the, um, uh, I mean, it was, a, it, it was a pretty remarkable period uh, in terms of, of, of professional competence really dominating, but then constantly having to defend itself. Contrast with the current administration is dramatic. So it seems to me that there is at least some aspect, and we're turning back to the question about how unique and how much was the fever pitch of this tension between the two did the Trump administration represent, because you've got a president that very much personalizes the issues on the table, uh, inserting himself very much in any issue, coupled with a unitary executive theory that would empower you know, centralized authority with him. So it, it very much became a part of, you know, as much as we might want to think of this as the presidency versus the administrative state, it was Donald Trump versus everybody who was against Donald Trump. And so John Dearborn, I guess part of the question here as far as the future of this relationship is the fact that those forces kind of you know, coalesced in a way that really exposed not just the tension, but this the centralization of of power and the danger of the centralization of power. Can we expect a pushback uh, and a general support on behalf of the deep state against the president as just sort of seen as this is a reaction to Trumpism? Is it in part because in many ways you went too far to the president and we need and we need some sort of a pushback? I do think that um, one of the key things that's arisen from the Trump presidency is that maybe in the public mind, um, the media more broadly, there is more of an active defense of administrators, officials, experts than maybe there has culturally been in a little while. It's sort of an American pastime to malign bureaucracy. Um, and with the pandemic and other things, you know, the Trump presidency has given us some sense of what is valuable about it. But looking forward and how unique is Trump, um, I do think you know one of the reasons for sure that Joe Biden was elected was because of you know the fact that he did pledge that he would defer more to scientists on the pandemic or that he would protect the independence of the Justice Department, and those may all be good things. But one question, of course, is how long can that last? Steve brought this up before. How long can that last based on the personal choice, the personal discretion of a president? 
we've seen, as we've noted, that even some democratic presidents who may not you know, embrace every aspect of the unitary theory in practice are often quite eager to subordinate bureaucrats in their pursuit of particular agendas. And so for right now, Joe Biden has decided he's deferring to the science, deferring to the Department of Justice, that's great. But is the next president going to do that? Right now, as Steve said, we have not institutionally changed anything in a way where, you know, if the next Republican president, for example, comes in, whoever that might be, and wants to start clamping down again, you know, they have it in their discretion to do that, number one. And also, as Des mentioned earlier, they do have a judiciary, especially filled with Trump appointees, that is more sympathetic to unitary claims, especially recently. The Supreme Court officially adopted unitary theory as doctrine in the consumer financial protection case. John Roberts said that uh, the structure of that agency where it had a single official insulated protected for a five-year term, that that violated the separation of powers, that that was a violation of the president's complete control over the executive power. So it's all set up for another president to come in and potentially do what Trump did or more. So Stephen, I mean, one of the things that strikes me has been the president's use of executive action, President Biden's use of, ex of executive action, as well as a real sense of kind of purging a number of the uh, agencies of Trump appointees. He had been extremely active in his first hundred days at trying to reverse just about anything he possibly could that Donald Trump had implemented. So is this a unitary executive that will show the ship of state kind of really jerking to the left and to the right, um, A, because the presidency has become increasingly partisan, and B, because we've empowered the president to be able to make these sorts of changes much more easily over the course of the last 30 years? Well, you know, we say offhand, colloquially, we say every president creates an administration of his own, but we don't really think about what that actually, if they actually did that, what that might mean. Uh, the question is, how deeply will they cut, right? And in fact, uh, under current conditions, when uh, the president is his own party, the president uh, runs a candidate-centered campaign, uh, brings into office his own political entourage into the White House to control the executive branch, the incentive is to cut deeper when you say I'm going to create my own administration to cut deeper. And that means replacing personnel, reversing as many policies of your predecessors. You know what Alexander Hamilton said? He said that a popularly elected president threatens a disgraceful and ruinous mutability in the administration of government because every new incumbent will want to reverse and undo the work of his predecessor. This is what ha this was Hamilton's nightmare. And Hamilton was an advocate of presidential power, but his nightmare was every new president using his pub a political mandate from his election to gut the federal government and start over. Uh, and that is exactly the kind of uh, system we've created with our current selection system and juxtaposed and joined to this expansive view of the vesting clause of the constitution. So I do think that, yes, I think that we're in a period of extraordinary volatil volatility back and forth. Every president creates his own administration and you know, try to run an environmental policy that way, right? Any policy that requires constancy, continuity, long-term commitment to any goal is very difficult uh, when you join a theory of the unitary executive to this kind of plebiscitary populist selection system that we have. Desmond King. I mean, this is really crucial, Douglas. It's, I, I, we, we talk a lot about the Trump administration, but it's not a book of just about the Trump administration. It is about the, the institutions of the American state um, and particularly the place of the presidency in that, but not just the presidency. It's, it's what this state apparatus is that's developed over the last, particularly over the last 120 years since the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, and where it's come. And then particularly since the Second World War in Steve's work about what he calls the policy state, um, that the great broadening and expansion in what government is expected to do, what the state is expected to do, um, with new presidents coming in who have their own agenda and who want to either not just reverse, but also push some agendas ahead. 
in that context, is there are huge institutional pressures. They need the expertise, the professionalism, and the competence of what, what is colloquially called the deep state. But they also want to try and push that uh, in a direction through exercising unitary executive powers. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an immense tension. And we tried to make this point in, a, in an op-ed um, in the uh, New York Times last month, um, saying how, how, how difficult and challenging it is. John particularly pushed this important point to set institutional limits on the, or limits on the institutional capacities of the, of the president within this wider context. The entire conversation in the book reminds me of a quote from a Billy Bragg song once said, God bless the civil service, the nation's saving grace. And perhaps <laughs> that's the lesson that we take from today. Thank you all very much. We've been dis discussing a new book entitled Phantoms of a Beleaguered Republic, The Deep State and the Unitary Executive. You can find it at Oxford University Press. Our panel have been the authors, Stephen Skorenik, who is professor in the Institute for Social and Policy Studies and of Political Science at Yale University, John Dearborn, postdoctoral associate and lecturer at Yale University, and soon to be assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, and Desmond King, the Andrew Mellon Professor of American Government at the University of Oxford and fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford. Thank you all very much. Thank you to our guests and to you for listening. The Scholars Circle team includes Doug Becker and Lillian Ng, contributing hosts, Ankine Agassian and Melissa Chiprin, managing producers, Sud Dongre, our webmaster, Tim Page and Mike Hurst, engineers and technical support. I'm Maria Armudian, and we'll see you next week.